Welcome to Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius, your source for horror, sci-fi, suspense, and all things violent. Thank you guys so much for joining me today on Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius. I hope you had a happy Halloween. Maybe you got in some of those horror flicks that Billy Graves recommended last week. Hope you enjoyed that episode, but that is really cool. But this week it is back to me. I don't have a guest, so it's all my stuff. But I also have a lot of cool shit going on. I've been thinking about a lot of stuff, trying to figure out my business, the best way to expand my business, to expand my reach, what my goals are, all that kind of stuff. But before we get into that, I want to tell you at the end of the episode, we will share a short story from Twisted Reunion. That short story is Woodshop Aftermath. Had a lot of fun with that one. Definitely Stephen King vibes, early vibes, but I hope you guys dig it. But in addition to that, I am going to read a little bit from Beyond Brightside. I think a lot of people forget about that book, Brightside's Little Baby Brother. But before I play that short story, I will read the start from Beyond Brightside because they're going to talk about that, why you should check it out, how many people probably forgot about it. They probably read Brightside a long time ago, didn't realize that there was a part two, how they're missing out. We don't want that. I don't want you guys to miss out. No way. All right, before we get to the free stuff, let's talk a little bit about writing, what's been going on. Life has been awesome, very productive. I have not been working out this week. I kind of slacked on that for sure, did a tiny bit of yoga, but my brain is going full speed. I am getting a lot of stuff done. Death Fest is going really well. So happy about all that. I want to clean the rest of it up, man, hopefully within a week. Right now, Glenn's giving me back pieces. I'm cleaning up the rest of it. Still got to figure out some death scenes, all that kind of stuff. But fun stuff, exciting. And then I get to jump into Duncan Ralston's trying to play at Ghostland, trying to figure out some of the death scenes, that kind of stuff. So that is exciting. I got a lot of cool stuff ahead of me. But right now, let's go into Brightside and what is happening with that. That is my debut novel. Hopefully you guys have read it. It is about thought thieves, people that can hear the thoughts of those around them. Very flawed character. Joe is bitter. He's got some women issues. He did not have a great childhood. If you're able to hear the thoughts of those around you and you knew your mom was promiscuous and your dad, you knew what your dad was thinking, like, It'd be tough. And if you knew what everyone else thought as well. So that's Joe's thing. I'm not trying to justify his behavior, but it's his 100th day in Brightside. That's when the book starts and he just needs to escape. He's ready to get out of there. No, no matter what, one way or the other, he is going to get out. So I made that book permanently free. It's free on Amazon, everywhere eBooks are sold. Also through my newsletter. Some people say, especially a lot of other authors, will say you shouldn't give your stuff away for free, that it devalues your, you know, your, your work and people won't appreciate it, blah, 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 blah. True, maybe, whatever. But those people also probably have never read my work. They probably never will read my work. This at least gives me the opportunity to find new readers if they enjoy Brightside. And I don't care whether or not they get the other books for free too, because if they enjoy a book, they might leave a review, they might leave a rating, they might tell their friends, which is priceless. So I want as many people as possible to read my stuff, whether it's free, not free. And I have enough books to where I can do that. So, and with Brightside, well, it's actually in every one of my books, in the eBooks, it's at the very start of the book and then at the end, but it says, get your free eBook. And I try to lead people two, I'm offering the uh, Morsels of Mayhem in this one. So, you know, they can go there. That will expose them to horror and my nonfiction because there's a piece about traumatic brain injuries in there. If they like that, maybe they'll go on to get Twisted Reunion, some of my other horror. Maybe they'll look into TBI or CTE. And then with Brightside, it leads directly into Try Not to Die in Brightside. If you enjoy Brightside, then you probably want to check out Try Not to Die in Brightside. Get to make all kinds of cool decisions. You get to see Joe from a different character's point of view. So I enjoy that. I thought that was a lot of fun to write. And then Beyond Brightside carries it all over. So it connects. You don't have to read Try Not to Die in Brightside in order to enjoy Beyond Brightside and get the whole story. But I think it definitely adds a lot to it. So you get to find out a lot about Becky. Beyond Brightside. I thought it was a lot of fun. If you haven't read it, I think you're missing out. You may not enjoy it, but it's very fast paced. 
very violent, very dark. And that's what I love about it. So anyhow, get Brightside, pick it up. Yesterday was awesome. Yesterday there were over, 50, I think over 1500 downloads of Brightside, which put it to, I think got it to 72 in the Amazon store of all free books, which is awesome. So now it's about trying to keep it up there. So I plan on posting a little bit on TikTok, reminding people that it is free occasionally, talking about it. But if you could tell others about it, that would be awesome. I would appreciate it greatly. But yeah, so that is free. That will be permanently free. Amazon might come around at some point and, and put a price back on it. I hope not. But for now, it is permanently free. Also free this week is Try Not to Die at Grandma's House. That's over there somewhere. I don't know. It's buried. So that book will be free for the next five days. Today is the third. I believe it's free through the seventh or so. But pick it up now and let me know what you think. That is from the Try Not to Die series. Each book is standalone, interactive. Every couple of pages you choose what happens. If you choose wrong, you die or your sister dies. I like it better when just you die, but sometimes I guess the death of a sister or a sibling or parent might qualify as a death. Nah, whatever. Check it out. Hopefully you enjoy it. And after that, you get to read Try Not to Die in Brightside. Then you can check out Try Not to Die in the Pandemic, Try Not to Die in the Wizard's Tower. And coming soon, I already have the cover. I haven't shared it yet. Maybe next week we'll share it. It's pretty cool. But Try Not to Die on the Wild West, that is with John Palisano, who wrote Try Not to Die in the Pandemic with me. So very excited about that. We are going to be releasing that on Kindle Bella relatively soon, waiting on it from the editor. As soon as I get those final changes, we will put that up there. So that is awesome. I'm excited about it. That I have my entire catalog wide, except for the Try Not to Die series, which is still exclusive to Amazon. It's, I can really play with the prices. I could run better deals. I could drop everything to 99 cents. I could set to free sometimes for different stores. So I'll play around with that. Another cool thing I just did was with Brightside and 25 Perfect Days, I set the audiobook to much cheaper. I set it to $6.99 for both of them. That's the cheapest of my full length audio books. But I thought that's a great way to get people in as well. So I know a lot of people don't have that much cash to spend on audiobooks. This makes it a little bit more affordable. And when I was changing the price on Findaway, I kept getting these alerts saying, hey, are you sure you want to sell it for this cheap? It's the suggested price is $11. You'll make more money if you sell it at $11. I was like, yeah, maybe, but let's do it at $6.99 anyways, because why not? Like, who cares? I'm just testing stuff out. If it works, Cool. If it doesn't, then maybe down the road I could raise it again, but I really don't see the point. But then I get a second alert saying, are you sure about this for the library price? You know, do you really want to charge $6.99 when you should be charging, I believe it said $25.99? It's like, yeah, why not? Because I want libraries to pick it up. I want people to listen to it. If they like it, they'll go on to other stuff. It's exposing them to my writing. So that is the whole game plan. Those are reduced right now. Twisted Reunion, I believe, is still $2.99. Don't quote me on that. I think it's $2.99 for a couple more days. But I try to run promotions often. So always check in. And if there's something that you really want to read, you don't have the money for it, send me a message. I'll probably hook you up. Probably. But you better leave a review. Damn it, I do not like when I give people stuff and then they don't leave a review or tell me anything about it. That kind of blows, but whatever, that's part of life. So this week I had a great talk with someone that is going to help me grow my business, take a little bit more seriously, fine tune some stuff, fix some stuff up that I just have not been taken advantage of. Like I have this newsletter, I think it's a pretty great newsletter, but I don't use it the way I should. I haven't set it up the way I should. So I believe I'm going to do all that. But talking with him, talking with some people from his company has really got me thinking about, you know, being smarter about things and what I could be doing myself that I don't need another company for. That would definitely make a difference. Part of that is asking for stuff. Like on here, I don't think I've ever done it or I may have done it once or twice at the end of the episode, but it would be huge. I would greatly appreciate it if you liked, subscribed, and shared this podcast. You don't do all three, 
But if you could do two of those, actually even one is pretty cool. Two is even better. Three would be pretty fucking awesome. So, and maybe if I get enough people, I'll stop swearing so much. Probably not, but you never know. So anyhow, if you could subscribe, like, share, leave a review of the podcast, of my writing, I would be incredibly grateful. Now, back to our show. I'm in a good mood. I'm ready to read a story. Now, if you have not read Brightside yet, go download it for free or order the paperback or get the discounted audiobook, although I'm not sure if the audiobook price is in effect yet, so check that first. Or go to your library and tell them to get it. Then come back to this video and listen to this part because I am going to read chapter one from Beyond Brightside. This is a spoiler alert, so stop listening right now or skip ahead to probably two, three minutes and I then you can listen to the story from Twisted Reunion. All right, here it is, Beyond Brightside. Don't listen if you don't want it ruined. Night seven, chapter one. Ooh, and there's all these cool bullet holes in night seven. Seven of them. Wow. That took me a little while to figure out, but I like how it turned out. Anyhow, now we start. In Brightside, I counted by days, but since the escape, it's been nothing but nights. It's nearly night seven. The last bits of sunlight crawling through the cracked mud that patches together the warped pieces of plywood. The floor is a filthy strip of brown carpet covering dirty concrete. Our roof a drooping blue tarp. This hanging black blanket is the only thing separating me from the rest of the shack. Our shitters and orange and black Home Depot bucket, a fifth of the five gallon capacity is filled with my watery mess. The plastic edge is embedded in my legs and ass because I've been sitting here so long. I should be sleeping, but I'm too ashamed to face the person whose life I absolutely wrecked. I can't let her see me like this. I assumed roaches would be the biggest problem under a bridge, but right now it's the flies. Dozens are buzzing between the bucket and my soiled clothes stuffed in the corner, but nearly as many are hovering above my left collarbone, the bloody bandage advertising a feast. With the sling off, I can move my lower arm a bit, but the upper part is taped right to my chest. Thanks to the oxy, I can't feel my ankle much either, just a hot throb. My toes are the deep purple of overripe grapes because I'm terrible at taking advice, ignoring everyone who said we wrapped it too hard. But none of it matters. All I need the foot for is this one last night. From the other side of the blanket, she whispers my name. Her voice is sweet and innocent, although I tore that away when I refused to take her no for an answer, a true American hero. Joe, she says loud enough to hear over the traffic. Please come back. I say I will. I'm almost done. The syringe glistens in my palm. Five cc's, more than enough to end everything. I need to say a prayer. Even when I was a kid, I thought praying was bullshit. Crazy how things change when the knowledge that you'll die one day solidifies into the understanding that the end could come any goddamn second. It isn't just the boots that want revenge. It's a whole fucking country, probably the world. They all saw the videos of what we did. According to the media, I'm a stone cold killer, the most wanted man in America. It's a long story, and if you don't know about Brightside, I don't know where the hell you've been. It's where they stuck us, a beautiful prison for telepaths, a power so great it made our lives worthless. That's the thing I need you to remember. They left us no choice. We had to get out of Brightside. We did what we had to, and there's one last thing left to do. All right, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. That is from Beyond Brightside, first chapter. That continues. Brightside, try not to die in Brightside. That is the finale. There is not a third part to that. So let's go out on Twisted Reunion. This short story is Woodshop Aftermath, narrated by T. Quillen. Hope you guys dig it. Have an incredible week, and I will talk to you later. Peace. Woodshop Aftermath It was Friday, Sam's birthday, and he had to see her before school let out. 
Then he had to get to his appointment with Dr. Heckham. Sam's present in one hand, his math book in the other, Tyler moved through the stream of students pouring out of their classrooms. He snaked past two football players punching each other in the arm, then a group of goth kids passing a vape pen. Tyler focused straight ahead. He wasn't in the mood to see their stares, to hear their mumbles, and call him Freak. He'd only started school one month before, but that's not why they talked about him. The hallway branched, right to the administration building and his appointment, left to Sam's locker. Dr. Heckham's warning not to be late echoed in Tyler's head. He turned left, hoped Sam would be there so he'd make it to his appointment on time. Sam, of course, wasn't there. She was never on time. Tyler set her present on a small desk in the hallway and wiped his sweaty hand on his shirt. What could he say that wasn't lame? Happy birthday. How's your birthday going? Did you get any cool presents? Here you go. Here's a present I made for you in Woodshop. I spent the last two weeks making it. Look what a dork I am. Do you know how pretty you are? Do you still like me? A few kids ran down the hall and a crowd formed outside the bathrooms. Someone shouted. Tyler picked up Sam's present and found himself at the back of a crowd when he heard a girl plead, Stop it! It was Sam. Tyler pushed his way into the middle of the throng. Bradley, a pompous prick, who would have been in tenth grade if he wasn't so stupid, stood over Sam who was on her knees trying to retrieve a pink bakery box from the ground. Every time she went to grab the box, Bradley nudged it out of her reach with his boot. Her fair skin flushed red, and Tyler felt the hair on his arms rising when she told Bradley to leave her alone. Bradley kicked the pink box against the wall. Tyler surprised himself when he said, Back off, Bradley. Sam and Bradley both looked toward Tyler. Then Bradley grabbed her hair, turned her head, and pumped his groin at her face. Sam swatted at his arm and flailed to get away but Bradley wouldn't let her go. Bradley, I'm not kidding, Tyler said, trying to keep his voice from cracking. Bradley talked so loudly everyone in the hall could hear. What are you going to do about it, psycho? Yeah, Hector chimed in from behind Bradley, his raised middle fingers a clear indication of what he thought about Tyler. What are you going to do about it? Pull a new town? Kent, their little dork follower, stood next to Hector grinning his idiot grin, then twisting his face into his rendition of a psychopath. No, man, this guy's all Virginia Tech. He's like the Energizer Bunny. He'll just keep going and going and going. <laughs> Three on one, with a whole bunch of kids to watch him get his ass kicked. But Tyler wasn't walking away from the only girl who'd ever stood up for him. A locker slammed shut at the far end of the hall and Hector jumped. Tyler dropped Sam's present and his book. It didn't matter if he was smaller than them. It didn't matter that he was all by himself. Bradley chuckled, kept Sam down with his hand on her shoulder. Are you... are you serious? Check this loser out, Tyler said. Let her be. Bradley stared down at Sam's chest. Uh, she's a big girl? She can take care of herself? I'm not telling you again. Bradley let go of Sam and took a step toward Tyler. Or what? Or what? What are you going to do, you little psycho? Bradley stuck out his chest, what they called puffing in juvie. Kids did that when they were scared deep down, and they were usually the ones who got their butts kicked. That's what Tyler tried to tell himself as he looked up at Bradley. Pretending he was someone else, someone stronger and more confident, Tyler said, I'm not scared of you or your little buddies. Oohs and ahs came from the crowd. Before Bradley could respond, Tyler took a step toward him. Donnie was a lot bigger than you are, Tyler said, his voice flat and dead. No one said a word. Bradley looked like he wanted to say something but kept his mouth shut. A teacher that Tyler hadn't seen before came out of a classroom and yelled for them to break it up before she called the principal. Tyler couldn't help but notice she focused on him the whole time. Even teachers he didn't know had heard of him. They were convinced he was the monster the papers made him out to be. Tyler turned back to Bradley, 
but the punk and his friends were walking away, heads held high as if they hadn't just chickened out. If Bradley really wanted to fight, he would have done it in front of the teacher. In juvie, Tyler had witnessed one kid jump another one right in front of an officer, stabbing that kid's neck with the sharpened end of his plastic fork one, two, three, four times before the officer pulled him off. The rest of the crowd dispersed while Tyler helped Sam off the ground. She thanked him, but didn't need to. The way she looked at him was enough to make him take on a dozen guys. She was the one person who didn't believe he was a monster, who knew he was innocent, who believed he wouldn't want to hurt anyone for any reason. She knew that Tyler, prior to his juvenile hall stint, wouldn't ever do something so vicious. But that kid had been forgotten by everyone else. They only saw the Tyler who had spent the last three years locked up. He looked different. Maybe he was different. He learned that sometimes people needed to be hurt. Sam picked up the mangled pink box. It was filled with brightly decorated cupcakes, most of which were squished, their frosting splattered on the dirty tile. You shouldn't have done that, she said. Tyler tried not to stare at her low-rise jeans as she stood. I'm glad to see you, too. She swiped her hair from her eyes and said, Sorry. I'm just surprised to see you. She kicked her locker closed. Don't you have your appointment today? Tyler wasn't listening. He scoured the floor for his present, spotted it by a row of lockers. Luckily, it hadn't met the fate of the cupcake box. He picked it up, gripped the wooden cylinder, not sure if he should give it to her. Sam repeated, Don't you have your appointment? Well, yeah, but I was passing by and thought I'd see you. Sam motioned toward his math book. You passed admin on the way from pre-algebra. What can I say? I'm still new here. Tyler forced an awkward laugh. Haven't got the place figured out yet. You should get going. The bell's going to ring any minute and you can't be late. Then we'd better hurry. Tyler grabbed her hand. I'm walking you to class. Sam hesitated before following. You can't walk me down the hall. I don't want you to ever get in trouble because of me again. Tyler almost said that he would do anything for her. That she was worth it. What's that? She asked, indicating her present. He almost offered it to her and wished her a happy birthday. But he saw the clock. Less than two minutes. Sam told him to just go. Tyler began to pull her in the opposite direction. Woodshop's over here. I said I'd walk you to class. Sam complained, but not too much, and hurried with Tyler to the lone building outside the double doors, where the loud noises wouldn't disrupt the other classes. At the door, Sam looked down at her mangled box of cupcakes. These are ruined. I worked so hard on them, she said. You made your own cupcakes for your birthday? Her look said she was surprised he remembered. Tyler said, I thought you hated Jenkins. Why take the cupcakes to Woodshop? I need all the brownie points I can get. Jenkins hates me, especially when I don't wear a skirt he can look up. Tyler changed the subject, worried he wouldn't be able to talk if he thought about her smooth thighs peeking out from under a skirt. You do just as well as any of the boys in there. You'll find that I'll, that doesn't you'll find out that doesn't always matter. You'll find out that doesn't always matter. Unable to think of anything clever to say, Tyler simply said, "Well, that sucks." The bell was going to ring any second, but Tyler didn't care. He tried to remember if Sam had always been so beautiful, if she'd always been so quiet. He wondered if her dad still drank too much, if things had gotten any better at home. Fifteen feet from the door, the bell sounded, signaling the start of seventh period. Tyler opened the door and held it for her. Will you just go? Sam begged. I really don't want to see you get in any trouble. Tyler nodded, started jogging backwards. I have a present for you. I'll give it to you after school. She smiled before she turned to head inside. Mr. Jenkins, with his creepy mustache and safety goggles, ushered her in. Someone inside the class whistled. It was Bradley, who was sitting at the table closest to the door. The prick patted the empty chair next to him, telling Sam he had another place for her to sit if she didn't want to sit there. Tyler headed back, 
didn't care that Mr. Jenkins was in the middle of roll call. He pushed open the door all the way. Excuse me? Mr. Jenkins said, clearly pissed. Go take your Ritalin or whatever it is they give nutjobs like you, Bradley said. Hector and Kent laughed. Mr. Jenkins snorted. Tyler didn't waste any words, just headed straight for Bradley. The look of surprise on Bradley's face was priceless as he pushed back the chair, struggling to get to his feet. If Tyler had been any quicker, and if Sam hadn't yelled at Tyler not to do anything stupid, Tyler would have embarrassed Bradley in front of the entire class. But Mr. Jenkins was quick. He blocked Tyler's path, a two-by-four in his right hand, his left hand extended like a crossing guard. Don't you have somewhere to go? Yeah, go to see your shrink, Bradley pointed at Tyler. You and I will talk after school. Tyler imagined how good it would feel to rip the wood out of Mr. Jenkins' hand and bash Bradley's face. Ignore him, Sam said. I can take care of myself. Without looking at her, Bradley, Hector, Kent, or any of the other assholes laughing at him, Tyler spun around and headed for the administration building. He was late. His heart was pounding. He took deep breaths and practiced Heckam's positive thinking drills, told himself that Bradley wouldn't really try to fight him after school, that the punk would end up chickening out. He tried to forget about Mr. Jenkins threatening him with the lumber, and he concentrated on the smile Sam gave him when he told her about the present. Tyler pulled out the wooden cylinder he'd only finished the night before. He hoped Sam would notice the effort he put into the picture-perfect alignment of the bracelet she'd given him back when he was in the detention facility. Sam and Tyler, best friends forever, the bracelet said. He wondered if she knew how happy he had been to get it from his mom when she visited him. He wondered if she knew that bracelet was what got him through so many lonely, scary, miserable nights. Maybe someday she could be more than just a friend. Tyler entered the office, nodded at the secretary, and headed to the last door on the left. He stopped in his tracks when he saw that his mom sat across from the stuffy old Heckam. What are you doing here? he asked. This couldn't be good. Your mother is here because I asked her to come in. Heckam folded his wrinkled hands. The real question is, why are you late? I forgot I had to come today. I got all the way to Woodshop before Mr. Jenkins reminded me. Heckam glanced in the folder. You have Woodshop first period. I, I, I'll have to put this into my report to Officer Wright. I warned you that I would. Tyler shrugged his shoulders, trying to seem like he didn't care, but he did. Should I also add insolence? It doesn't matter what I think, so do whatever the fuck you want. Tyler, his mom said, watch your language. And have a seat, Heckam said. Tyler did as he was told, well aware that Heckam would love to bury him in the progress report to Tyler's probation officer. Tyler took a deep breath and said, I'm sorry I'm late. But I did forget that I had this appointment. That's a convenient excuse. Not about to take the doctor's bait, Tyler sat quietly. We've talked about this, Tyler. Making excuses is one of the roadblocks to your recovery. I thought I was recovered. Why else would they let me out? Your rehabilitation is ongoing. We're to ensure you never do to anyone else what you did to that boy. Tyler wondered if a high school junior Donnie's size should be considered a boy, but he kept the question to himself. Not taking responsibility for your actions. That's been an issue for you, hasn't it? Tyler felt his mother stare and nodded. Only by taking responsibility for the wrongs you have committed can you begin to respect yourself. And only then will others be able to respect you. I'm trying. If I screw up, I try to admit it. He turned to his mom. Right? Well, for the stuff around the house you do, like when you forget to take out the trash or don't clean up after Lucas. She turned to Heckam. That's our blind Labrador. Tyler's very good with him. But that's not what we're talking about, Tyler. And you know it, Heckam said. I'm not admitting to something I didn't do. I just forgot. Tyler? Heckam began. Okay, I was talking to a girl. I'm sorry. Happy? 
A girl? his mother asked. Not that Samantha. No, Tyler said way too quickly. His mom was silent for a moment. She looked at him and said, What did we do wrong, Tyler? Your dad and I did our best to raise you right. How did you get like this? Before she became hysterical and started to cry, Tyler said, Nothing. You guys did nothing wrong. Then he looked at Heckam and added, Neither did I. Heckam cleared his throat. Then why were you arrested? Why did the judge sentence you to three years in juvenile detention? Because no one believed me. Is it so hard to believe that I'm telling the truth? That I didn't do anything? Heckam shook his head. The facts are the reason why no one believes you. You were found covered in his blood. I was trying to help him. After the damage you'd done. Tyler tried to remain calm, trying not to think about every humiliating experience in juvie. You can't even consider that maybe Donnie fell down? He looked at Heckam and then his mom. He did have epilepsy. The doctor pointed out that the tests proved Donnie didn't suffer a seizure that day. Then why did he have a history of beating you up and teasing you? Well, maybe the test was wrong. You ever think of that? What he did have was a history of beating you up and teasing you. Tyler shook his head. He wasn't going to convince Heckam or anyone else, even his mom. Only Tyler and Sam knew that he hadn't hurt Donnie. Only Sam knew what had happened before Tyler arrived. Tyler had been on his way home from elementary school when he heard the scream coming from the alley. The second scream he'd recognized as Sam's. He'd run full speed toward the sound of her cry. He'd never told anyone that part of the story, and he wasn't about to now. Heckam wouldn't have believed him anyway, and he couldn't bring up Sam in front of his mom, who always said there was something wicked about that little girl who always said there was something wicked about that girl. His mom was right, but she didn't know the whole story. The doctor asked Tyler's mom some questions, leaving Tyler to his memories. He remembered racing into the alley, his heart thudding against his chest, seeing Donnie on his back flopping around like a fish. In Donnie's clenched fist was the cherry donut Tyler had given Sam earlier in the day. It was smashed just like the cupcakes in her pink box. Hearing his name, Tyler snapped back to the present, realized Heckam was asking him something. His mother started speaking when he interrupted her. Tyler told the doctor he didn't feel well. I need to go to the bathroom. Heckam excused him with a wave of his wrinkled hand. Make it quick. The memory replayed as Tyler left the building and jogged past the bathrooms. Sam had been standing over Donnie, her shirt ripped, her cheek an angry red a palm print still visible. Donnie's face was red, too. His blonde hair was red. The concrete was red. Donnie's eyes were wide, staring at Tyler. Donnie was scared, his expression begging for help as he raised his own head off the ground and smashed it into the concrete with a sickening thud, blood spraying everywhere. Without a word, he brought up his head again and smashed it back down over and over again and again. Sam just sat off to the side with her eyes closed. Tyler's jog turned into a sprint, the woodshop building still fifty yards away. He hoped he was overreacting, that Sam wasn't doing it again. He was probably just imagining things. But if he wasn't, this time he would do the smart thing and take Sam away. He wouldn't listen to her cry while he tried to make Donnie stop bashing his brain into the ground. Running faster, the distance closing, Tyler's heartbeat sounded like the thud, thud, thud of Donnie's skull. He remembered how Sam stood and watched Tyler try to restrain Donnie from hurting himself even more. He tried to kiss me, Sam had cried. He tried to kiss me and touch me. Don't tell my dad, Tyler, please. He'll say it was my fault. Now only ten feet from the woodshop, Tyler heard the scream of machinery. That was not unusual, but Tyler still hesitated to open the door. He gathered his courage and entered the building. Most of the students were bunched together in the far corner, staring at their feet or the back of the person in front of them, their hands clasped over their ears. Hector was the closest of the three boys who were not lucky enough to be part of the herd. 
He stood in front of the planer, both of his pinky fingers on the floor, looking like bloody sausages covered in sawdust. His face twisted in a horrified grimace, but he just stood there letting the whirling blade tear through his fingers a millimeter at a time. Kent was on the machine to Hector's left. He kept feeding his fist into the grinder, a slow, soggy push. Tyler spotted Bradley over the ripsaw. He was on his knees in front of the massive blade that was spinning, whirring, inching closer. Bradley looked at Tyler with his wild eyes as he pumped his groin into the spinning saw, chunks of meat and cloth and blood spraying everywhere. Jenkins was overseeing it all, shaking in the corner while his favorite pupils mutilated themselves. Sam was sitting behind Jenkins' desk. Tyler ran over to her, pleaded for her to stop. She told him to leave, her voice cold and calm. Nothing like it had been with Donnie. Why, Sam? Tyler asked. Why? They were going to hurt you. It took Tyler a moment to find his voice. You have to stop. I can't let you take the blame again. Plus, she motioned toward the other students, all the eyewitnesses she let live. It's too late for that. Now go. Tyler knew she was right that there'd be no way out of this incident. But he wasn't ready to leave her. While Hector took off his remaining fingers, the grinder polished Kent's forearm, and Bradley completed his evisceration. Tyler took the wooden cylinder from his pocket and placed it on the desk. Happy birthday, Sam. Sam smiled, stood up from her desk, and kissed Tyler on his cheek. A few of the other students ran from the building. Sam told Tyler, Go. Tyler could only think of the kiss, the kind words, not caring of the carnage surrounding them. I'll stay. No, you won't. I need you to leave. The cops are going to show, and I don't know if I'm ready to let them take me. You can't be here for that. Tyler tried to stay, but Sam forced his feet towards the door. Her control over his body weakened when Tyler stepped outside. He jammed his foot in the doorway and tried to call Sam's name, but nothing came out. All he could do was watch as Sam focused her attention on Mr. Jenkins, who'd just started the jigsaw.